economy stage of impact during the World Economic Forum 2024 in Davos. Uh, wow, what a mouthful, quite a long title. Very excited to be here and open the show for this amazing program the next four days. Um, really made possible, thank you so much to the economy, to UBS, to all the other partners. My name is Michelle. I am the CMO and a managing partner at Tenity. And before we really go into any of the amazing startup presentations, I would like to invite Andreas Eaton, Tenity CEO, to the stage to just give us a quick introduction on who we are and why we're here. Is it okay if I sit? All right, thank you very much. Also very pleased to be here in uh, Davos. It was a really nice train ride. In Zurich, there was still, the weather was not as good as it is today here. So for those who are dialing in live, um, I think you just miss out on the blue sky here up in Davos, so it's great. So I'm here just to talk a little bit about Tenity. We are a global innovation ecosystem focusing on the financial insurance sector. What we basically do is we invest into very promising early stage startups and companies, which one of a couple of them are also showcasing during this week here at the economy stage of impact. And um, we also help incumbents such as the banks and the financial insurances to actually innovate uh, to you know get access to promising uh, companies that they can you know uh, move things forward and create some impact on the innovation landscape. So what's our involvement with, uh, with the economy and, uh, you know, in general with, you know, climate fintech and so on? So already three years ago, we started, um, you know, to look at the space as a, you know, attractive way to create impact. Um, I think since then we have a strong focus on, you know, everything which is related to, um, you know, companies in the financial sector who create an impact on the ESG um, elements, and I think um, that's also the reason why we partnered up with the economy here, um, uh, because it makes a lot of sense, you know, to, to bring all those innovations and those uh, movements to to the World Economic Forum here in in, in Davos. Uh, maybe a quick word about Tenity. So um, um, we are, you know, very active as investor. Invested already in more than 250 companies in the past. Originally, we started back in 2015. In the meantime, we have presence in Switzerland, so we run an incubator here in Zurich, not far away from Davos. We do have an incubator which is located in Singapore, and um, recently we also started in Estonia with a, you know, an incubator where we support on the one hand, on the other hand, also where we invest via, with our own fund. So that means also we are a VC, um, with the ambition to create nice returns, obviously, but also to, um, you know, um, bring real innovation into an um, industry, which I think is still, there's still a lot of two things to do. Um, Tenity has around about 55 people, so it's not a huge company, but very, I would say, very effective and productive. Um, and, um, yeah, nice to be here, and I think that's it. Thank you so much, Andreas. All right, so now we really get, get into the thick of things. Um, really excited that as Tenity we can host this uh, session on Tech for Impact. This week, actually every day, we'll have a session where we bring you know, startups that have amazing solutions at the intersection of technology with finance, AI, nature, biodiversity, representation, mental health, food, agriculture, an amazing diversity. Um, there are 15 companies this week. Uh, today we have three that are ready to take the stage and raring to go, I'm sure. Um, and you know, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the first one. Uh, this is Julian Osborne, founder and CEO at Peltate. Hi everyone, nice to see you. My name is Julian Osborne. Uh, let's see if this clicker works. Perfect. So thanks to Tenity, thanks to Economy, and all the partners for having us. Um, I'm going to present uh, Peltite, which is a startup that was founded roughly two and a half years ago. 
we were part of the Tenity incubation program really early on. And for us, it was great. Um, great because it's at the center of the financial service industry in Zurich. And uh, we had, yeah, we still benefit from, from invites like this. <clears throat> so what is Peltate about? Um, the European Union is going to uh, leverage massive regulatory requirements onto companies across the European Union. So by 2028, around 50,000 companies will have to directly report on sustainability. We call it sustainability accounting because essentially you need to do a kind of financial, but with non-financial accounting, um, aggregate it and then report it. And if we think about that, all of these 50,000 companies have big supply chains. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them. Actually, the number of companies that have to report on their sustainability is in the hundreds, hundreds of thousands. And a lot of these companies will not do this themselves. Just as financial reporting is outsourced, we believe that non-financial reporting or sustainability reporting will be outsourced as a service. The topic is rather complex. It's company specific, depending on the size, the geography, the industry, and the organizational structure. And it is rather costly because data is often not available. Data is spread across the organization, entities, systems, etc. So when we set out to create Peltate, we wanted to address these challenges. And we built a web-based application that's been live now for a bit more than 13 months with the goal of being able to aggregate all types of non-financial data, all types of sustainability data, use it to calculate any type of KPIs that might be relevant for the main regulatory changes that are coming. So that also includes CO2 emissions, working on integrating climate risk and biodiversity topics. And finally, we don't only just want to do reporting, but it also helps companies improve on their sustainability. So our client base is growing. One of the first POCs we did actually, so I'm going to thank Tenity one more time with six. That was very helpful as Tenity was, used to be called F10 and was part of six. Um, and so far it's going really well. We have uh, only renewals going on, but I don't want to boast too much about, about that. It's just we have managed to build a system that tells clients how to report and what to report. But very early on, we realized com companies will ask, what now? Imagine you have your first report or your first carbon uh, footprint. They will ask, what now? And we believe we can answer this question in the form of a sustainability marketplace. On the sustainability marketplace, which we will launch on the 17th of May this year, because we have a big event with, uh, with the Swiss Stock Exchange again. Um, <laughs> I do not have my Apple ID ready. <laughs> Actually, I'm an Android user, so it would be a bit of a <laughs> first time experience for me. So um, yeah, we will launch this, this, uh, this marketplace on the 17th of, of May, and we will start with three offerings on there. The first one will be around CSRD. So this is the regulatory um, development by the European Union, which requires climate risk and bio, well, nature risks and biodiversity is part of that, and climate risk. These are KPIs that can be calculated through third parties, which we will integrate directly in the tool. The second one, second offering will be about education. There's a lot of organizational resistance still, unfortunately, when it comes to sustainability, and we want to plug in companies, offerings around education that uh, help reduce those um, barriers. And the last one is we're actually not building this tool to go out into the market with it ourselves. We're building it for consulting companies. We're building it for managed service companies. And so we will probably have around 20 to 30 of those being off offering their services, industry-specific, size-specific, language-specific over the, the platform. There are more ideas in the future um, around CO2 credits, financing instruments, etc. but let's see. And ultimately, all of the information coming together in the, pool, in the tool Pelt8 should also be the basis for what we call a Pelt8 AI Sustainability Manager, which we hope to launch by the end of the year. 
And what do we hope to achieve with all of that? We want to help 100,000 companies by 2030 become more sustainable and reach their climate goals. And we think that financial services will play a pivotal role in this. Um, banks and insurances, but they need to recognize this opportunity. So we've started working with banks and insurances, and we see a kind of development, a recognition that sustainability reporting or sustainability accounting comes from a bit of a must. We need better data, we need to report this data, we need to reduce the risk. Now we also see that it can incre increase stickiness. I'll give you two examples in a second. But also this could be the basis of new products. So this is our pitch when we go to financial service companies where we actually offer our product to their clients. The first example we did was a carbon calculator for AXA, essentially building a bespoke offering for their clients onto the website of AXA to increase awareness on the topic of sustainability. The next steps still in discussion, but in an ideal case, we roll out our tool for their corporate clients to help their corporate clients with the um, sustainability reporting and accounting, and in so helping also AXA. The second such um, POC that we've just completed successfully is with Mobiliar, where we essentially defined a path to sustainability for their corporate clients. Again, we want to reach 100,000 companies. We're not going to do that if we are approaching one by one. We want these multipliers. And next to the consultants and managed service providers, the biggest ones for us are the financial service companies. And just to mention it, because it will be in the call for action, we also launched an initi initiative called the Sustainable Supplier Reporting Standard. I do not want to invent a new standard here, don't worry. It is basically, a, I don't want to say it like that, but I think it's the best version, CSRD, reporting for dummies. So we essentially simplify the most complex reporting out there into a form that an SME is able to do it. Why? Because a lot of large companies are starting now to send questionnaires to their supply chain, and each questionnaire has a unique thing. So the poor SMEs are just getting one questionnaire after the other. And we managed to get a, quite a bunch of cool companies together, kicked this off on the 27th of November last year, and now have three working groups. Essentially, one working on a data model, the second one on a blueprint on how to report, and the third is, how do we run this in a neutral fashion into the future? So what is the organizational governance of this initiative? Um, hopefully, we'll be able to present some results during the Point Zero Forum. I'm saying this now because that's what the ambition is. <laughs> so our call to action, if anyone wants to get involved, is join our Sustainable Supplier Reporting Standard Initiative. Um, obviously, we'll help with sustainability and climate reporting, so if you're interested in that. We also support your supply chain. Right now, we're focusing on financial service companies. Um, and finally, we are in the process of closing our seed round. And if you want to get to know us better, feel free. We have some events upcoming, 30th of January at 6, the climate reporting landscape in Switzerland. Um, and again at 6 on the 17th of May, the Swiss Climate Reporting Forum. So 6 is the Swiss Stock Exchange. Yeah, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Also, I was given 15 minutes, but I didn't have a watch, so I've, I'm a bit in limbo here how much I actually took. <laughs> Maybe I'm breaking the ice a bit, you know, Tulian, thanks very much for the great presentation. A question from my side. So in order to scale your kind of business, what is the biggest challenge you face when you, for instance, talk to financial institutions? I think in Switzerland in particular, the challenge is around trust for a startup to work with a big financial institution and then being able to give them the confidence that we can work with their corporate clients. That is a big challenge. We were able to do that with Mobiliar because following Tenity, we did another startup program called Kickstart and they're partner of those. Um, and I think the longer and the more track, the longer we are in the market and the more track record we have, obviously the easier. But this initial trust, do we let a startup work with our corporate clients is, uh, is the biggest challenge. And then stuff like 
procurement topics, IT security, etc. But that's something you can solve once you have kind of the the go. How do how do you solve the trust uh, the trust challenge? Any ideas you could share with us? Charm. <laughs> <laughs> I do think, unfortunately, unfortunately, I mean, I speak Swiss German, but that does help with a lot of the more local players. Um, and then it is finding these opportunities where some of the bigger players are in these startup programs. For us, this has been the best way of actually f creating pilots, creating POCs. So that's why Tenity was, was valuable. Even if six decided to dissolve the project group, um, we still did a pilot with them, and that was very helpful. And the Kickstart experience with Mobile Air was great. So my recommendation would be more companies should join these kind of programs, create a sandbox kind of environment where they're willing to take that leap of faith and show some trust. Thank you. Thank you for a very good presentation and I love your concept. Um, I was thinking about, as, as you stated in the beginning, the re reporting part is, is a really complex challenge for many corporates and, and especially for those who is, is just in the start. Uh, so I tend to perceive that there is very much about the customer experience on the corporate side. How do you work with that and what is your feedback so far? Good question. Um, so we are startup, so obviously we'll say the customer and the user is at the heart. <laughs> um, it took us almost a year before we launched the uh, the MVP and uh, in the design of the MVP we actually really talk to clients and I mean everyone will say that but I can I'm very happy that last week we actually brought three of these clients together that had never talked with one another and they were so happy for the peer-to-peer -peer exchange and providing not only insights but they're almost motivated now to invest into this platform because they they've been with us since the beginning so, obviously, it takes time, you need the user feedback, but I also think you can almost go one step further and involve the clients in this process, because the clients we have are also on a discovery journey. How does it work for them? So, you, we started with such a simple product, which also caused a lot of criticism if we talked to investors, but because it's so easily copyable. But essentially, why do you have something complex if the clients are not at a level where they need complexity, but they need simple things solved? So that was a bit of a longer answer than I wanted to give. But essentially, you have to work with the clients and understand that they're also going through a journey. So involve them in that journey. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for, for a brilliant presentation and also looking at um, the need for this out of the regulatory landscape shift not only in regard of competing in your home court, but also to, to make sure that we do not further accelerate the north and south or west and east divide, looking at consistency and comparability in numbers. And I love the idea about simplicity. I think there is too many anal companies trying to get everything perfect, and we cannot let perfect be the enemy of progress. Um, so we need to get going, right? And we're on a clock. So simplicity is all good. However, what I'm, cons what, I'm, what I'm curious to better understand is how do you step up to a greater responsibility outside of the companies that are already on the ball, looking at working with UN agencies, UNDP, and so forth in regard of getting this going in, in countries where companies might not be as advanced, but will definitely be blocked out by carbon borders and carbon taxes unless they present impact data in a, in a credible way. Do you have any plans for that? Yeah, it's a super question, and I understand your concern. <laughs> um, for us, the next step will actually be working more with um, trade organizations and bodies. We're still in Switzerland, so we won't go too international beyond EU this year. We'll be more later. And in Switzerland, there are a lot of trade organizations, associations. But I think the learnings from that then will be the basis to extend this internationally. Because what we realize, the EU regulation will really affect a lot of the companies that bring goods to the EU. And there might be um, tariffs, there might be taxes, indirect or direct, on companies that haven't really changed much other than that they don't report adequately. So 
we think that companies or let's say geographies where there is a big um, impact, even though it might not be uh, uh, apparent right now, through this regulation, I think that would be the next iteration. Um, and there, I mean, there, I don't know the biggest trading geographies, but South America is rather big. We already had some conversations there where the companies that are looking ahead, they realize we have to start doing this now because this is an iterative process. Every year we get better. If we wait until the moment that we actually have to report that way, we will be punished. So long story short, this year we'll probably still be working more with the, let's say, local trade organizations and use that as a learning how we can go to the international trade organizations or representations, especially in the geographies which are um, exporting a lot of goods and services to the EU. Thank you. Yeah, Julian, great presentation. Thank you, and awesome company. Um, my question is, uh, how do you see the role of AI um, in your company and in the future of, of reporting? Yeah, I've been thinking about it a lot, especially because I used to work for a fintech that called itself a big AI a couple of years ago, and I was very AI skeptical myself. <laughs> but <laughs> things have, have changed on my side. I do see the availability of use cases through simple tools will facilitate many steps along the sustainability reporting or sustainability accounting journey, also for us. So we've defined use cases along onboarding, data interpretation, data ingestion. Um, I think there are various use cases. So let's say simply available AI will facilitate the entire journey for sustainability accounting and reporting. And I dare to say even a step further, using insights gained from that reporting will be even more crucial to get us going. Um, it might not completely, probably won't get completely rid of the consultant. There is still a lot of organizational resistance to any kind of change in the company. So just saying an AI told us to do that, I, I just don't see that happening. But even if it can get 60, 80% done, and then we have consultants being actually empowered by really working on the nitty-gritty things, I, I see a big opportunity of AI um, once a, the data structure is a bit more in order for the companies, yeah. Thanks. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, even though I'm not a numbers guy, I'm gonna ask you one or two questions about your business model. How do you sell this? Uh, is it recurring? Do companies need to contact you once a year to get certified again? And then my side question is, uh, are consultants, are they competitors to you? Because that's, that's what they would do, right? Or, or are they more partners to you? Good questions, thanks. So business model-wise, the first year we still did a lot of onboarding ourselves to learn, to keep it simple. Um, now we are getting to a stage where the next hire will be I don't know what the title will be, but one of the key components will be autonomous clients. That's one of the main objectives. So the idea that we do not have any client interaction if possible. Um, and if we need, then we actually leverage the consultants that we work with. Yes, there is a certain competitive element, but primarily for those consultants who do body leasing, where they are spending time collecting the data for the clients. That's I see direct competition. Otherwise, we're much more a facilitator of um, consultants because they don't want to be the ones being in the excellent collecting the data. We actually want to make them more efficient. And so that's our business, case, uh, business model moving forward. We, just in, we are just interested in the, in the um, SaaS fee. And if a consulta consulting firm wants to do an implementation project, maybe for a bigger company, they can charge on top. Or if you're a managed service provider, uh, an accounting firm, for example, and you want to offer, in addition to your financial accounting, now uh, sustainability accounting, then you can use Peltate, kind of like a QuickBooks for your clients. So we just essentially are interested in the recurring component. And I'm happy to say that five, we got the news yesterday, in the fifth client that we signed in the first three months of um, launch, so 13 months ago, the fifth client has now renewed. So we have, on the recurring part, 0% churn, which I'm very happy about because uh, 
yeah, it was an MVP, and they had trust that we could develop it. And, and very quickly, if you achieve the 100,000 uh, SMEs or, or clients, uh, what that translates into revenue, how much would that be? Yeah, so we want that by 2030, and I don't know how accurate the oh, it won't <laughs> be accurate. financial projections are, but we are hoping for somewhere around 270 million. <laughs> All right, so maybe one, one last question from my side. Um, if there's any change you could wish for in, in your space, in the sustainability reporting space, what would that be? I think the newer emerging companies, startups, younger people, younger than me, of course, um, they have an attitude of we need to collaborate together and I think that is so crucial also when it comes to the whole standard setting, the frameworks, because in the past, a lot of, I guess it was political incentive to have a geographical standard framework, etc. But we need to get rid of that. And if we can reduce the overhead that comes on the reporting by f simplifying standards, by working together on this, um, but also the different tool providers, that would be one thing. So, yeah, collaborate completely open on this, uh, this challenge we have. All right. Thank you so much. Ah, one more question. Consider it a, a compliment. This is a very inter interesting topic. There are so many, so many questions. And on the, on the forecasting, I think from if, you, if you said it would be accurate a few years from now, no one would believe it anyway. So I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, talking about collaboration and, 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 and you know, having leading expertise on global level close, close in, in, your, in your efforts, are you teaming up with, with any of the you know, best-in-class data providers of today looking at S&P Global and what they're doing and learning from them or inspiring them or, or others? Is that something that you have talking about collaboration and partnerships? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I honestly, I'm going to take a cheeky reply here. I hope we inspire them to simplify the, what they're actually offering because what I've seen from their products um, is sometimes a bit challenging for their clients. So let's leave it at that and open. I hope we inspire them to simplify their offering. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your questions, it was fun. Thank you so much, Julie, and a round of applause. All right, now I'm excited to introduce our next founder. His name is Mark Mettler, he's a managing partner at Third Eyes Analytics. Big round of applause. Thank you, Michelle. Welcome from my side. As said, my name is Mark Mettler. I'm leading business development at Third Eyes Analytics. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Um, we as a company, Third Eyes Analytics, uh, we specialize in two things. It's uh, goal-based investing um, by means of uh, professional asset liability management methodologies. And the second core competency we have is sustainable investing, and I think that's the reason why we're here. Um, our two founders have worked for close to 20 years in that space, uh, so it's really part uh, of our DNA. So. Um, as a starting point, um, I would like the audience, how many of you believe in a, uh, that we can limit um, climate change to 1.5 degrees? Hands up. One out of many. So we're probably definitely in the single digit uh, percentage here. Um, yeah, so I think uh, that's also in line with what has been uh, recently published uh, Recently, I think it was late, uh, late uh, spring, um, by the United Nations IPCC uh, in the sixth assessment report. What you see here is uh, the implemented policies versus um, the trajectory which we would need in order to limit uh, climate change to one and a half degrees. Um, what was not so much in the news, but what is very, very groundbreaking was that uh, climate sensitivity is now effectively expected to be between two and a half and four degrees. Um, the uncertainty was halved due to uh, um, break, uh, uh, a groundbreaking research. So the trajectory has clearly been um, revised upwards. So why is this essential? Because adaptation becomes key. 
I think mitigation, pure mitigation strategy will probably, uh, will probably not suffice anymore. And why does that matter even? Um, what you see here is a chart of three integrated assessment models. Um, these are multidisciplinary tools um, which allow um, or assess the impact uh, between uh, the interaction between uh, natural and human systems in the context of climate change. Uh, with the DICE model, the Nobel Prize has been won 2018. So it's really um, thorough research. And there are two things which are worthwhile mentioning here. The first one is, um, obviously the reason is clear why policymakers want to limit uh, the rise in temperatures to uh, two degrees or one and a half degrees even, um, because you see that the impact is minimal then. What is also consistent in these, in these um, three IAMs is that a rise in temperature will have an exponential impact at some point in time. And if you're talking three, four degrees, you see how the curves become uh, more exponential. So again, um, adaptation is absolutely essential. And what you see is effectively um, the impact on uh, global GDP growth. So why do you, wealth managers, their clients, need to uh, deal with that? Um, end of day, um, clients want to achieve financial goals, um, whatever that is, finance retirement as an example, um, achieve a certain return over a certain period. Um, well, wealth managers, um, they are looking for ways to decarbonize uh, their clients' portfolios. And the struggle they're currently facing, primarily in the European um, Union, is that regulation, and here we are uh, back to Julian's presentation, but more on the on the interaction between the advisor and the client has, come, has become so complex that in those questionnaires, um, the advisors or the clients, they often tick the box, I'm not interested in sustainable investments. So um, due to regulatory complexity, effectively decarbonizing um, 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 becomes a challenge uh, for wealth managers. And last but not least, they're looking for ways to differentiate. I would like to show you how climate change affects a client's personal wealth, how we make that transparent, tangible, how we allow offsetting the adverse impact, and how we at the same time enable financial institutions to decarbonize client portfolios. What you see here is an exemplary balance portfolio of a client 35 years old. I took a male client for once. And, and what you see here is uh, the share of cash, which is, I think, about 20%. I can't even read it anymore. And there's some equities, about 35% roughly, and the rest is in bonds. So a classic balanced portfolio. So what happens if we, if I am a client, let's assume I'm 35 years old, I'm a bit older by now, but I would like to know what can I take out of that portfolio until expected life end as an amount so that it just suffices in the expected capital market scenario until life end. Let's ignore all the pension systems and these, these elements. Just what is the performance I can expect and what can I take out on a monthly basis? What you see on the left-hand side is I can take out roughly 7,600 pounds without the inclusion of climate change impact. If I simulate the three degree temperature increase, and I told you before about two and a half to four degrees um, is the expected range now. That is drastically reduced to roughly 5,000 pounds, which I can take out. That's a significant impact. And that's obviously, um, the impact is, is obviously higher if um, climate change is even more than three degrees. That's just really an example which I've taken. A very similar, similar chart you see here. What we have simulated here is the same case. The wealth development in thousand capital market scenarios on the left without climate change. And at some point in time, this client enters retirement and starts decumulating, so taking money out of that portfolio. And we see on the left that that client can keep his living standard easily. Uh, in the expected capital market situation, the client just runs out of assets at the expected life end. There's not much contingency, but it works. Right-hand side, simulating climate change, we see that the client runs out of assets um, before the expected life end or before expected planning horizon, whatever that is. 
Now, the key question is, not only don't clients know, be it private or institutional clients, what, what, what the impact is, this is what we make tangible and transparent here, but the question is also, how can they offset that uh, potentially adverse impact? And it cannot be fully offset, but it can be offset uh, to a large extent. And what you see here is... Uh, one of our innovations, so what we're doing here is we're optimizing the strategic asset allocation. So you may know that today, if you're a wealth management client, you get uh, an asset allocation which is called balanced capital gain income. So one out of five normally, very standardized. Um, UBS has probably more than a million clients, clearly more. Um, they get one out of seven asset allocations, standardized asset allocations, just to name one wealth manager. Others offer only three, most offer five. What we're doing is we're making that bespoke. So we're searching through billions of different strategic asset allocations, and each of those asset allocations we combine with thousand capital market scenarios. And we stochastically search for the asset allocation which fits the client best and maximizes the probability to achieve, in that specific case, the keep my living standard goal um, with that, uh, uh, that, that specific goal. If you have multiple goals, obviously we do it with multiple goals. But you see that the situation is clearly improved on the right-hand side. In the median scenario, um, it's more or less uh, back to the starting point without climate change, so I can achieve my goals despite the three degree temperature increase. And I also reduce the downside and the upside, uh, which you see on the top, the gray area, is obviously clearly improved. Now, how does the asset allocation look like? And why is that uh, how it is? We see that cash has been quite a bit reduced, I think from 20 to about 3%, if you can't read it. Um, bonds have been increased by about 10 percentage points. And equities remain more or less constant. That's probably a surprising part, that they remain more or less constant. And we have an allocation of 7% real estate. What the optimizer does, the optimizer moves into asset classes which are less carbon intense. And there's obviously sub-asset classes below which I don't show you here. But um, obviously uh, less carbon intense asset classes are less affected by climate change. And consequently um, the returns are, is, is uh, more or less uh, similar uh, compared to those asset classes where, which are affected more by climate change. The nice thing about that is that we do not only improve the risk and return figures, but at the same time we decarbonize the client portfolio on asset allocation level. And this is completely novel. This has not been existing so far in the market. You see the carbon intensity at the bottom, a reduction of more or less 10%, while all the classic uh, figures, um, be it uh, drawdown, be it standard deviation returns, while well, they increase. And we're talking about the, cl the client with the same risk profile. So the max drawdown, you see, we reduce the maximum drawdown, but we still improve returns and we decarbonize the portfolio. And this is not only important in light of rise of passive investments, which make up to close to 40% now in the market compared to actively managed investments, but it's also important uh, because that complements stock selection, instrument selection, not stock selection, perfectly. So if you invest less in a carbon intense asset class, you in the end can complement that by picking the right instruments of those asset classes and further improve on the decarbonization of the portfolio. What is the impact? If we calculate the impact um, for a mid-sized wealth manager with 100 billion assets under management, and if we do that and assume they all have balanced portfolios in which we optimize, you see that the impact is enormous. It's 1.3 million flights from Zurich to, to New York, and it's 67 million of full-grown trees over a period of one year. That is the impact. And that has been confirmed by the Swiss Te Federal Office for Environments Technology Fund, who did a six months due diligence and gave us a grant thereafter. I've shown you now how we make climate change impact transparent, tangible, how we allow offsetting negative effects of it, and how we decarbonize portfolios. I'm asking you now as the audience 
to bring us in touch with wealth managers who want to be at the forefront of innovation. And um, we still want to further improve on several ideas which we have in mind. Uh, so we're also looking for some capital to further um, innovate, uh, be it um, improving the advisor-client interface uh, with AI, which we have started already, and be it with further innovations in the sustainable investing area. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much. I'd like to open it for questions. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hi. Uh, that that was a good uh, presentation. Thank you. So you said you're looking for capital. Um, would you elaborate on that? Like for example, how much capital are you looking for? Yeah, we're looking, what milestone? We're, we're looking for plus minus one two million. Um, that's the, the the round we're looking for, and uh, we have nice recurring revenues. You see a couple of clients on the left hand side. So we have, for example, the largest life and pension provider. I'm happy to discuss that uh, bilaterally. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I'm not in this business at all, so I was, it was complex and a learning, learning experience for me. Uh, so uh, I'm curious again with the, with the clients. You have an extract of clients. What, what is the main feedback? And you have also an immense rewards and recognition. So what, what is the feedback in general? And what, what are the, um, the um, rooms for development that you see and that you get feedback for? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so first of all, um, clients use our solu solutions. It's a SaaS business, a configurable SaaS business. They use our solutions in different configurations. But for most of them, we power the advisory process uh, between a client advisor and client, uh, partially also in a self-service manner. Um, the feedback, we get two feedbacks from all of our clients. First of all, it significantly improves client acquisition rates. Uh, because uh, a, a, a suit from the shelf just looks nicer with the same fabric at the same price than what you get standardized uh, uh, from the tailor, sorry, compared to off the shelf. So increased client acquisition rates, that's the one thing. Uh, and the second thing, we're getting a high penetration into discretionary mandates um, because we effectively, our solutions help deal with clients' holistic problems. It's about their financial goals. So, for example, um, financing um, a retirement in a longevity situation while at the same time financing kids' university and uh, wanting to achieve a return. So that's the key feedbacks we're getting. And we've only recently launched uh, that innovation with regard to the decarbonization. Uh, so we're still at the beginning there, but it looks, looks good and we got some very promising feedbacks on that one as well. Right. I'm curious, actually, to learn a little bit more about what's next. Do you have anything, any innovations um, in store? Yeah, I'm actually not sure whether I should disclose everything. No. So, um, so I mean, on the on the climate change side, um, I mean, no. Let me start differently. On the AI side, I always uh, already said that uh, we want to improve the client advisor interface. The topic of planning, which uh, is is a big part of our solutions, is a complicated topic. And many advisors struggle um, if they don't have a very thorough education with planning and giving clients um, all those insights. So that's the one thing which we have de developed and which, for which we have a version life already. Uh, but we want to improve on that one. And the second one is really um, research uh, in the field, which I've been uh, showing before. Uh, so that means also um, finding out um, how climate change affects um, extreme weather events and stuff like that, and then integrating that. So that's more the volatility part uh, of uh, how does climate change affect the volatility part of uh, strategic asset allocations, respectively specific asset classes, and inflation as well, uh, because uh, we're not aware of any research that any research has been conduct conducted in this area. Expected returns we modeled, uh, that's the consequence why, uh, why, why, why you saw what I've been presenting. But now, obviously, uh, the distribution and the fat tails uh, of those distributions uh, is something which we want to investigate further. Um, I may have missed it, but you are a technology company, right? So you provide 
software to wealth managers? To wealth managers. Yeah, so we are a software as a service company. Uh, so we offer APIs and configurable software as a service to wealth managers, financial institutions. And you provide the data uh, or you tell them how to analyze um, weather issues or, or climate issues. Exactly. So we, we are actually a, a large calculator for them. Uh, if they don't use the front end, that's the pure API. And we rely on the data providers to uh, give us the respective data. So it's not that we really provide the data itself. For yeah. example, carbon footprints. Um, we rely on Sustainalytics as one partner, MSCI as another partner. Uh, so there are various data providers which we can, can tap upon. And you pay for that data, most likely? Our clients. I have more bit of comment and maybe a feedback. I think, you know, I, I met you guys in 2022 already and I think what you're doing is really amazing from my perspective because, you know, it shows a little bit kind of what the lever of the financial sector could be actually. Because it just, you know, you're showing the technology and the methodology, how we do it, but if you would actually, you know, step in the shoes of a client advisor and how he actually now talks to the client and then imagine, you know, what happened when all the clients would actually act on that. This would have massive impact on, on the whole industry. It's a ripple effect. And that's a bit, I think, you know, you're understating here a bit, I guess. I think you should probably raise like 20 million and use like 18 million for communication and make sure that all these kind of, uh, you know, financial institutions, the wealth managers start to change their mindset that they should have a completely different discussion with their clients. Because, you know, what you're showing here is probably that 90% of the people don't really know that this has such an impact. Uh, thanks a lot for the feedback, Andreas. Much appreciated. And uh, we can always discuss valuations and uh, discuss <laughs> higher rounds. So, uh, easy one. No, I think, I mean, I mean look, um, the challenge is probably a little bit, was Julian has mentioned as well. I mean, uh, um, who wants to be at the forefront of innovation? I mean, we see a couple of names here. Uh, who really want to, to tackle innovation. But I mean, how much innovation have we really seen in wealth management over the last couple of years? Question mark. Which was not regulatory driven. Even larger question mark. So bring us in touch with anybody you know who wants to be at the forefront of innovation. Hi, thank you very much. Well, on that note, innovation is a dangerous thing uh, because you may get caught thinking you have to innovate constantly. And you don't have to innovate constantly, you just have to innovate with continuity. And this, in, in this landscape, how, what kind of timeline do you see for your market to understand what your early innovation is before you confuse them with further innovation so that you actually monetize on what you have developed instead of chasing, you know, chasing the next innovation and the next innovation? Uh, it's a very, very fair question. Um, I, I also agree on innovation on innovation, which we have here, because it's the hyper-personalization of the strategic asset allocation. Now we decarbonize it additionally. Um, yes, but um, the thing is, I mean, you don't have to sell it as such, right? I mean, uh, here is a stage about uh, impact, about uh, innovation, so I wanted to share something new. But let me start, for example, with bringing planning into a client advisor discussion. Um, standard in the US, um, standard in, in the UK, mostly standard, um, because they have full fee transparency on wealth management. So it's the next evolutionary step that planning uh, will be part of any client advisor related discussion going forward. And here in continental Europe, we're lagging a little bit behind, mostly in those jurisdictions where there's an, a, a very established uh, wealth management uh, um, uh, industry. Um, so I think that financial planning will come. And then the next question is who can optimize several goals in one portfolio? And then we're probably at the forefront because our competitors cannot do it in one portfolio because they use simplified models. So, um, I mean, we see a nice traction. We've uh, recently acquired the first uh, Finnish client. Uh, we have now more and more inbound leads for, from all over the world, which I would have not expected. 
Um, so uh, it looks good. Uh, but here on that stage, I obviously wanted to show something new. And this is why you've seen the latest which we have developed. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that very much. And I'm, I'm just, I, I, as I love innovation, I'm just saying that, that it's, um, we see a lot of innovation, but we also see a lot of um, lack of, of um, patience. So how, because you're moving in a very slow industry, and it's slow per default because it's a way to, to be secure, really. Um, lack of speed is a, is a lack of making the wrong calls as well in that industry. How do you see the, the balance between innovation and integration in a year from now? What, in regard of your investment, what do people work with in your company? Innovation, integration, balance in 12 months. So I would say we have a small team working on the innovation. Uh, uh, our quant team has been working on innovation over the last uh, two, three years. Um, once the solution has been developed, I mean, we've entered, uh, we, we were founded 2015, we've entered the market 2018. Configurable software service platform takes a long time to develop. And since then, we have started uh, to acquire clients. And uh, the Quant team has been uh, continuously working on improving the engine, obviously, because that's liability management, very complicated topic, um, and has also worked on bringing down optimization speeds, which is important as well. And once this has been done properly and we were satisfied, they started to work on, on, on that whole part. Um, but I mean, I cannot give you a full answer. It depends A, on the traction, and B, on finding the right people, and C, on finding the capital in a 20 million space, which we discussed before, and I'm just kidding. But, uh, but it's, it's all very dynamic, and I can give you a financial projection, but as you've said before, nobody will believe it anyway. That, was, that were your words. I said, I said they, will prob they will probably, expectations will exceed your projection. Thanks for the feedback. All right, thank you so much. Big round of applause also for Mark. Thank, thank you, you so much. And now, last but definitely not least, uh, welcome Roland Voss. He's the co-founder at InCharge Technologies. Thank you, Michel. So, welcome everyone in the audience. Welcome everyone watching on the live stream. Um, today, I would like to tell you a story. And this story is about the append... No. Here we go. This story takes place in a place far away from Davos. Uh, the contrast, apart from the sunny weather, couldn't be higher. This is a square in Africa. And as you can see, traffic, it's chaotic, it's colorful, it's messy. Um, my name is Roland Foss. I'm CEO, co-founder of InCharge. And before I started InCharge, I worked five years with the largest solar companies in Kenya and in Nigeria to electrify these vehicles. Now, technically, the, my projects worked. But commercially, they never really scaled. And you know why? The main reason is finance. I learned that there are 50 million of these vehicles around in the continent, and 80% of the fleet is financed. So I would like to introduce you right now to the protagonist of the story. He's called Mwangi. Mwangi is a rider. He earns his living as a motorcycle, a taxi motorcycle rider in Nairobi. He's a father, he has three kids. Um, and he would like to get an electric motorcycle. Mwangi earns $3 per day, and an electric motorcycle would save him $3 per day, doubling his income. But he can't get one. And it's because of this number. This number, I think, relates to the theme of Davos of this year. It is a measure of trust, or more accurately, it's a measure of distrust. Any guesses? what the number could be. This is the interest rate Mwangi needs to pay. Um, now, if we look at an interest rate like that and relate it to our world, you would be paying, instead of 1200 a month for your Tesla, $3,800 a month. Now it's not such great value for money anymore. Just imagine it would bring clean tech revolution to a meltdown in our world. 
It's doing the same in Africa. So for Mwangi, basically this interest rate is like a huge stone he needs to carry on the back of his motorcycle. It's hard to make a living like this. So let's take a step back. Why are these interest rates so immensely high? It's because lenders are in the dark. Lenders have their data sources, but they don't put them to use. They are struggling. They're facing sometimes default rates of up to 20%. Um, and what they use in reaction is a high touch model. So lots of food folk on the ground to manage the collections from Wangi. Um, so this is what we're looking at. Mwangi doesn't have a profile. The fact that the lenders have so many food folk out there blurs their data even further. So they don't know their customer. He has no identity. He's considered a high risk. Therefore, they add a lot of people on the ground, which adds a lot of cost, and then they need to charge these high interest rates. And currently we're at a point that these high interest rates will cause many Mwangis to default increasing their risk portfolio even further. So <clears throat> about eight months ago, I um, started thinking about this problem on how to lift the stone out of Mwangi's motorcycle with some of the brightest minds I know. Michiel Berger, he's an AI guru. Uh, Anshu is a Kenyan co-founder of the largest, one of the largest solar home system companies in Africa. Um, and just as a point of reference, we took Indian interest rates somewhat comparable market, it's 20% there. So we know it's possible, we know it can be done, and it needs to be done. So <clears throat> we developed the Loan Hub. In our solution, we wanted to build something that's really effective and scalable. So first of all, we're targeting large institutional lenders. Second of all, we're using data in AI, so it's, so it's scalable. So what do we do? We take the data from lenders. Um, this can be payment data, GPS data, uh, KYC data, CRM data, uh, plus metadata, and we create a dashboard. We give Mwangi his profile, and we score him. And we score him real time, not just on payment. Payment, behavior, activity, safety, etc. We also provide a platform which gives Mwangi a chance to see what's going on. Currently, after Mwangi has closed his loan, the only interaction with the lender is when he doesn't pay. Uh, a writer app gives him insight in his loan, uh, but it also provides training modules um, and a wallet for which he can save for a service or school fees. And finally, there's the tech and touch engine this will help the loan officers be way more effective. And this is where basically um, many of the repetitive actions are taken over by AI uh, to help the loan officer with his collections, but also to help Mwangi with his loan. So it's more than just payment collections. It's about behavior-based training suggestions, behavior-based nudges. So if Mwangi is, is speeding, he'll get a text message. If he's continuously driving unsafe, he'll get a training course. Um, the, this metric is really important, the 2x. Um, when we started out, lenders were complaining about default rates, but we are actually learning that the amount of vehicles one loan manager has under management is the, the key driver for the cost. So by making this more efficient, we'll be able to help lenders lower their costs. So what does it look like? Lower risk. Um, lower operational cost and uh, identity for Mwangi will lead to lower interest rate, locking, unlocking EVs for the best profiles, uh, and lower default rates. So when we started eight months ago, we uh, were lucky enough to be part of, uh, of the Tenity uh, select group of startups. Uh, and we've been working with some of the leading lenders in the space in Africa. So we're working with a, on a pilot with Platcorp, which is East Africa's largest microfinance. Uh, and we onboarded the largest brick and mortar bank uh, in Kenya. 
Um, now, let's take a step back. We know that there are, are many people like Mwangi out there. They need money to get an electric vehicle. Um, and I think this actually relates to the previous uh, presentation. Um, the money isn't getting there because Mwangi doesn't have a profile. On the other hand, um, there is just not enough money at all. Um, so how do we actually make money available throughout this chain? So impact capital to lenders in Africa, rider groups and the riders. And I think the, the key aspect here is data. Uh, not just between le the lender and the rider, but we have to involve all key stakeholders. And that means rider groups, but we have also have to be transparent towards uh, impact capital funds um, about um, the, the profiles. Um. So yeah, this, <clears throat> this problem is bigger um, than just mobility. Um, we've, we're really focusing on this first segment to tackle problems one by one, uh, but we're learning that the many lenders in Africa are struggling um, we've been approached by several companies in the space simply because we do, quote unquote, something with loans and AI. <laughs> um, this is a good example. Um, uh, Sun Culture is providing agriculture, solar agricultural equipment, uh, and we're working with them basically with the same loan hub um, to de-risk loans. And another good example is uh, solar home systems. So, basically, um, I'd like you to, uh, to ask you to join us on our mission to lift the stone of Mwangi's motorcycle uh, and give him a battery pack instead. Um, I guess um, for us today, we're, we're an eight-month-old startup. It's really, really cool to be here. Uh, but it doesn't mean a thing if we can't make an impact. Um, so I challenge you to think out of the box uh, and, and help us with um, relevant contacts, um, access to uh, wealth managers, so we, we can have a, a chat later on, um, projects, uh, know-how. This is uh, our, our contact, my contact details, so feel free to reach out uh, and uh, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Super exciting and, and congratulations on this rapid progress. Uh, obviously a very interesting and, and uh, potentially lucrative win-win for both. Um, how do you, so you, I noticed that you had a lot of funding within, within the African continent. I think it's also a bit challenging to, to cluster Africa as, you know, because yep. it's, so, it's so different. Um, but how is how is international funding looking at this from another perspective? Are you are you challenged to get money in from others working in collaboration with others? And if there is anyone in the room who has done because this is an SME kind of effort, yeah. uh, a micro SME effort, I would say. But I hear there is uh, other uh, startups that has progressed down this road in you know South America, Latin America. Doing, doing stuff, <laughs> doing stuff with SMEs, exactly the same thing. I think there might be some advice to, to hear mm -hmm. as well. But what is the, what is the um, uh, recognition you get from, from funds outside of Africa? Um, so we're not a fund ourselves, so we're, we're a SaaS. We, we help lenders um, getting access to loans and de-risking loans. Um, m my experience is that it's... it's for, for successful loan portfolios, it's very easy to get um, to get funds to unlock funds. Um, however, it's much harder to do the same thing for for funds that are earmarked clean tech. Uh, and I think that that is the the one thing that needs to happen. So many IFCs, etc., they they fund companies as in traditional lending. They don't help them transform to new clean tech lending.
Hi. Congrats on, on what you're building. I just have one question. <clears throat> it's it's going to be more focused on the interest rates, the APRs. Yeah. The APRs. As you know, in Latin America or in Africa or in India, um, Southeast Asia, you're used to paying high uh, interest rates, right? But there's two reasons. The first one is um, the central banks' uh, interest rates are higher than the ones in Germany, Sweden, France, whatever. Yep. And the second reason is because of risk. That's the main reason of interest rates, and you apply that to your model. So, for example, you were mentioning that um, usually is they have an NPL of 20%, right? So there is still a high, um, let's say, margin in there. So in a money perspective, how are you going to help these type of companies be profitable? Yeah, th that's a great question. Um, so we're running... Because that's where you need to nail it. Uh, absolutely, 100% agree. Um, and of course, each country has its challenges. There, there's inflation, often double digit, which also exactly. adds to interest rate. Um, I think it uh, goes back to the slide I just presented about the tech and touch engine. The, the key thing you can um, uh, make an impact with is making sure that their loan officers are much more effective. And that doesn't bring it down to 20% immediately. Uh, but it can help de-risk the, the, or lower the cost, lower the interest rate, and de-risk the, the client. You can also focus it also on the client, because that's the guy who's going to pay you. So you can analyze also the client and their data Absolutely. with an underwriting of provided by your, your SaaS. And then you can s like yeah. select this type of uh, lend, no, the client can pay you this rate because he has a perfect score. Exactly. And that's, that's also how you, you, you connect the, the dots? Exactly. That's what we plan to do. So we make the, the, okay. the data available throughout the financial value chain. Yeah. Good. I'm a lender. <laughs> uh, it's a cool, cool presentation. I spent some time in Central Asia looking at microfinance loans, yep. Kyrgyzstan and Georgia. And one initiative, so this was back in 2015, uh, one initiative that everyone suddenly started was around financial literacy and education. Because it seemed like that was missing a lot. So there, there were even initiatives from one of the um, micro lenders I went to that they would create a, a, a coloring book <laughs> for a, a, how, educate, how to educate kids on financial literacy. And I think it fits actually with the question before because one big part of the risk comes from just not knowing how certain things work when it comes to fi financial literacy. So what are your plans, or are there any plans in that regard yep. um, when it comes to your platform? Because you basically have it with, uh, with the lenders, but also with the users, right? Yeah, this is, this is something we definitely acknowledge. Um, so a couple of things. Um, first of all, what we've been doing right now is with our um, launching customer, is basically rework their financial literacy internal training for their own employees simplify it into something that we offer through the app. Um, and we can also, based on the data we see, offer it and, and tailor it to certain people, right? If you always pay on time, maybe there's no need to follow your financial literacy training. The second part is you can also control it with the wallet. So the wallet, for example, just before a service or just before school fees, we would be able to freeze it uh, and basically help them get through uh, spikes in their their spending. Maybe a very quick question. Thank you. Oh. Go ahead, please. Thank you. <laughs> From my side, um, I think technology is helping you out in many ways. So just to collect all this data, all this uh, metadata to, to generate a profile, that's a huge benefit in that everybody even in Latin America or Africa, whatever, has a mobile phone. I think also in the payment, just to execute payments and receive the payment. Uh, my question is, how is your vision or whatever you have already uh, to monitor? Because that's part of the largest expenses also. It's not only 
taking the decision and getting the information, but also to monitor throughout the the uh, the life cycle of that loan. So, what kind of steps? How, how how do you support the lender on that? Because otherwise, you will need you know to have people to constantly be checking, going. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good question. Um, so so far, we've limited ourselves on the monitoring done by the loan manager. So that's the dashboard. And, and normally when there is, there is a default or a problem with a rider, it turns into a, a mini research project. So he has to take information from the GPS screen, from the, the core <laughs> banking application, CRM, look up some, co some contracts. It takes one and a half, two hours before he actually knows what's going on. So that will help him a lot. We're, we're also speaking to CFO level to see you know, what, what they can already do what they can, how we can help them. Um, but that's, that's a, a more difficult conversation, I think, because they, you know, the, the way they look at data and, and report internally, it, it's, it's, uh, it's very much a habit. Um, and I, I mean, for example, we, we would like to see um, portfolios um, presented based on credit score or predicted default rate, right? Uh, that's data we can generate, um, but I think many many financial institutions are, are, are very traditional in the way they report. Um, but yes, we're working on that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have invested in a number of companies doing loans, micro loans, uh, similar to this. Why don't you offer the loan yourself, since you know the uh, the the loan taker, right? You have all the data. Yeah. And then you can undercut the banks, and, and, yeah. and maybe it someday become a little bank or something. Yeah, we should have. And, a, and we should have a coffee. Yeah, anytime. <laughs> I, lo I love. I mean, I think loans are the best, best uh, way to make money. But, but it's for, in your case it's yeah. something good. Um, <laughs> and also, how how much did the interest come down now since you were in in, in Africa? Uh, we're just we we're starting the pilot right now. Okay. So now we're we're looking at how effective the system is and what the engagement is of the of the loan managers, and it's looking really good. Um, I, I actually think that we we said we could increase it by two x. I think we can increase it by at at least three x. Decrease. Increase the number of vehicles per loan manager and then it decrease the cost yeah, by by see. sixty seventy percent. Yes. Okay, but maybe you can answer the first question. Why don't you guys offer the loan yourselves? I think what, what we're first we want to create all these profiles, uh, and then our current thinking is, is a second step to finance lenders. Right, it's it's the middleman, right? Just cut cut the guy in the middle. Just go straight to the uh, to the person that needs the money. But, but he needs to, then he will need to raise also debt and equity yes. because the equity is going to be for the technology and yes. the debt facility is going yes. to allocate yes. that business. I've done this many times. And debt comes usually from a, a financial institution exactly. directly to them. The equity will give them or us or all of us. Yeah. <laughs> that flows into the company, right, for, for operations, yeah. No, no, that's the way it works usually, but... But you have a middleman, which, mm -hmm. which I don't like too much. But. Or you can connect lenders. You can connect also lenders and charge a commission there. That's it. That's mm -hmm. it. There is a plenty of way to monetize your business. Yeah, yeah. You mean like like uh, brokerage of profiles? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. But again, like uh, you're selling to the guy that they don't, I'm sure they don't want to lower the interest rate because that, that's their business, you know. So if your mission is to lower the interest rates, you're selling to the wrong guy. In a way, why? Because like you have like the country risk plus the rate plus the yeah. default. When you build up the rate, is really pricey at the end. So I if you know all the sorry, if you know all the data from the lenders, you could go direct. Like yeah. this, sir said. Um, so of course, the the interest rate is their RSP, and they can still charge it. But um, many lenders, not all of them, but they're they're struggling, and they're they're seeing, they're acknowledging that this high interest rate is actually inducing their defaults and causing them to have this huge amount. So our client has 8,000 people, loan managers, 
spread throughout East Africa, doing nothing but collections. Right? That's a pain. So if you can lower it and lower it performance-based, right? You um, you can you can make your operations simpler and also more tech-focused. Because this is actually it's more the case for traditional lenders. New lenders, tech companies, they start out the way we, we, we work. So we're offering it specifically to traditional lenders. Um, but then I, I fully agree, we also acknowledge that if we really want to make an impact, either we do it ourselves or we provide earmarked finance to the lender and make it happen. Because that's, that's the only way you can fully control it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Marie Claire, Business Sweden. I just wanted to add to the, uh, some of the great advices here in the, in the audience. Uh, there is a new hub in uh, Kigali, Rwanda, called Norskian. Uh, reach out to them for, for collaboration. And they also have a fund, uh, Norskian 22, uh, investing in sort of C-stage um, African companies. So uh, it would be a, a way for you to find partners and also talent. So just a small piece of advice. Great, thanks. One more coffee. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was just curious also if you looked at anything at um, the more operational, not on lending, but the charging infrastructure, and if you need or need to include the charging infrastructure conditions or uh, providers in your business model or in the ecosystem? Sorry, what? what, what? Chargers to charge the vehicles. I mean, to charge? Away. Yes, yes. I, I met with some, some people starting a, an infrastructure yeah. uh, and maybe you could just exchange yeah. ideas. And, I don't know. Definitely useful. Yeah, I, I think so. So the technology, I've, I've developed that, that myself and, and um, you know, it's, it's working. It's not the main problem. Uh, but of course, it also needs to be financed and, and actually is an opportunity for lenders as well. Thank you. Yes, I was thinking you had, uh, you, you, you brought up solar as one, uh, as an additional uh, vertical, but everything yep. that is capital intense out of a yep. micro SME or SME perspective is obviously in the limelight for this. So. How do you see, what other verticals do you foresee that would be financially interesting? And also coming back to your point around, you know, cutting out the middleman yep. and increasing the number of verticals instead, instead of the number yep. of layers in the cake. Yeah, I, I, I see um, phone finance as a super interesting and strategic one because then also you control the phone. You can help them manage their data. Some of some of the people like Mwangi, they spend maybe 10% of their net income on data. So, and, and, and they just use, they don't manage their Android phones really well. Um, so helping them out with that, but also controlling it, um, you can uh, provide or integrate to the GPS tracking app. So making sure you know where the phone is, you, you make sure where, where Mwangi is. Uh, I think that's, that's the, probably the most strategic asset to, to look at. And um, it's the one asset that everyone needs. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Roland. Thank you. And uh, thank you to everybody uh, in the audience. I think uh, this is the spirit of, of, of this, these days, the economy stage of impact, um, contributing, asking many questions, and collectively brainstorming. It was great to see. Thank you all so much uh, for being here. Now we're closing this session quick call to action, you know, uh, we are all um, supporting each other here. I think, you know, reach out to the founders that have presented to you today, um, see how you can support um, or how they can support you. And yeah, amplify the message and become part of the change. Thank you so much. Yeah, so it's, um, it's quite emotional, actually, to see so many generations of, of brilliance and looking at the different startups being presented here. Uh, my name is Matthias Wikström. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Deconomy. 
working together with Tenity and many others to get this to get this done to try to use our progress in the benefit of others to succeed as well uh, I think we can all agree that the climate crisis and, and the challenge that we face is not a Elvis solution you know there is no silver bullet to this it's not the one-man band everyone's effort is needed and we need to work together in order to get that done. It is obvious that there is capital that is interested in this. There is obvious that there is great ideas and innovators and entrepreneurs that, is, that enable solutions to bring this front and center. And I think what we, why it is an emotional moment is because we see so many generations looking at what we've started doing five years ago and where we are today having uh, friends from Capital in the room, one of the most successful ever startups coming out of Mexico, uh, working together with us as our first client of the economy in, in that part of the world. And also looking at all of the partners that we have been able to work together with in getting this done, looking at Tenity, obviously, UBS, looking at S&P Global, uh, and many, many others that have made this possible to begin with.